hello, everyone. I am Ross Tate. I am a programming language design and implementation researcher and consultant. Um, recently, I've been working with the Kotlin team on revamping and extending Kotlin's type system. Now, by the end of the talk, I'll give you a sneak preview into one of the extensions we're considering, namely a form of union types. But before I can explain that, I need to illustrate what I mean by revamping. And to do that, we're going to look at a program that does really fast integer to string conversion. It's quite small, uh, it has a convert function, it has a configuration interface, and it has a converter class. And if you follow the integer in this program, you'll see that it passes through the code and gets returned as a string. Now, hopefully your reaction to this is, hey, that's not safe. Let's not do that, please. We just introduced a memory corruption into our language, or vulnerability into our language. But you'll be glad to know that this program is indeed rejected by the Kotlin compiler. And in particular, it says this converter class relies on the input type being a subtype of the output type in order to type check and be safe. Uh, but int is not a subtype of string, so this program is incorrect. Hurrah, we're safe. Um, except I'm not done yet. So give me a little bit of room to work here. I'm going to add a magic configuration class that implements our configuration interface. And I'm going to add a little type annotation using this class. And if I do that, now that program type checks. Same execution, but now it's safe, apparently. And you might be wondering, why does this happen? This seems like a problem. Uh, why is I now a subtype of O when it wasn't before? And the answer has to do with this little magic right there. This type projection, you intuitively think of it, ignore this. This is nothing. I don't care about this. But behind the scenes, what has to happen is that it gets modeled as an existentially quantified uh, type argument to magic and configuration. And this unknown type, of, uh, type argument is going to be a subtype of string and a supertype of int. Now, of course, you're going to say, well, there is no such type between integer and string. And in fact, that's perfectly fine on its own. The existential type is not what's the problem here. We can't make a magic configuration of this type in Kotlin. But we can trick into thinking one exists by using null. And so the combination of these features tricks the compiler into thinking that there is a type between integer and string, which is why it accepts this program. Now, if you think that's either really cool or really horrifying, either way, you can thank Roman Relizarov for this. Uh, <laughs> He developed this example. He did it by adapting an example that I had written for Java. And that, in turn, was adapted from an example that Nada Amin and I had written for Scala. So Colin's not alone with this problem, but that doesn't mean it's you know, OK to have this problem. So part of revamping is making sure that type checking is sound, meaning any program we accept indeed ensures the guarantees that we expect the type system to provide. Of course, we'll still have backdoors like casts, but those are explicit and intentional. We don't want these unintentional ones that the type checker doesn't even know what insert a runtime check for. All right, that's half of the picture of revamping. The other half is type inference. So to see a problem that we have here, let's consider our, a tree class. And this has branch nodes with labels of type B and leaf nodes with label of type L. With this very generic formulation of trees, we can do things like represent a binary sorted tree for the adjective to use for a given quantity. Um, and <coughs> if we type check this program, everything works great. And this is super important because if we didn't have things like type inference, then you would have to write out 10 type arguments in this program. So type inference is a critical part of the Kotlin experience. But at the same time, this program is kind of doing a lot, right? It's both sorting all the values and listing, creating all the values. Let's break it down to smaller parts. So we have our adjectives, and then we have the sorting of the adjectives. And if you've, if you've done this, now the program doesn't type check anymore. The Kotlin compiler says, hey, I can't figure out what B is supposed to be for this leaf here. And that's a problem because that violates a decomposition principle, right? You're going to write large programs. You want to be able to break your large programs into smaller programs and not have that break the type checker. 
Um, so this is something we'd like to fix. Now, I wanted to analyze this problem and understand a little better, so I decided, okay, I'm going to take this example and mess with it. I'm going to make everything covariant, uh, because I knew from the research community that there were solutions for this problem space. So I ran it through the compiler, and indeed, this one type checks. But this one doesn't still. And I found that odd, because now there actually is a way to infer B that's really nice. You can make B be nothing, and due to covariance, that's going to subsume any other thing you could infer B to B. Um, it's, called what's a, it's what's called a principal type argument for this expression. So why doesn't the compiler do this? I asked this question to the team, and awesomely, they were able to give me concrete Kotlin issues that led them to explicitly reject this kind of program. Um, and I, being a very user or usage-oriented designer, went, dove into those issues to figure out what programmers were doing that prompted that. And what I found, interestingly, was that all these programs eventually led to Java. Um, and that made sense, because a lot of my research has to do with Java, and in particular, the fact that type checking is impossible in Java. So what do I mean by this? Well, as a concrete example, subtyping in Java is undecidable. If you want to say, hey, can this type A flow into this type B? Radu Grigori showed that you can encode an entire Turing machine with a Turing tape into that question alone and get the type checker to run arbitrary competition for you, just to answer a subtyping question. Um, and so this undecidability leads to a bunch of odd behaviors in the type checker, which was causing odd designs in the Java code that this Kotlin code was interacting with, which led to this change to the Kotlin design. Um, so as much as we'd love at this conference to be like, hey, well, this is Java's problem, not our problem. Unfortunately, it is also our problem as well. Uh, the proof by Radu translates to Kotlin just as well. So Kotlin shares in these kinds of issues. And these issues raise a number of uh, problems for Kotlin and for Kotlin developers. So one of them is this topic that I kind of touched upon with the reliability of your type checker. Right? You, as developers, all want to be able to write and design and plan your architectures and have this intuition for the type system and know that, OK, I planned around this intuition, so when I write this all down, it'll all work. And not have something weird like, oh, suddenly I rearranged the lines of my program and now it's rejected. Right? you should be able to predict reliably what kind of programs are going to get accepted by the compiler. Um, and for that, you need a decidable system. So really, if you want to standardize Kotlin so that we can all, uh, when it's running on all these different platforms and being implemented by a variety of tools and analyzed by a variety of tools, they can all agree on what a Kotlin program is and what makes a Kotlin program valid, well, you run into issues if you have an undecidable system. Uh, back when Java 8 came out, the explicit goal was to address a problem that people were finding they could not move their Java code from one compiler to the next because each of them had implemented type inference differently, and programmers are running into different corner cases with type inference, so code was actually not portable across compilers. So they added what's now 37 pages of specification of the type inference algorithm so that everyone had to agree on how to implement this exact algorithm in order to get them all this code portable which is something that Kotlin, I, like, especially if they were to ask me to do this, I don't want to do that. Um, toolers, I imagine, don't want to read 37 pages of this to make sure they're conforming to this. Uh, and developers just should not have to even worry that this thing exists. Um, so having a decidable system makes it much easier to standardize your language. Uh, another problem that's come up is stability of your code. That is, you have code you've written now, you'd like that code to keep running the same way it does. But again, the Java community found that due to issues of decidability, certain updates to the type checker will actually change the behavior of your code. Uh, if you improve the type inference algorithm, it can change which methods get resolved in which ways. Uh, and that's not something that Kotlin developers should have to worry about. So decidability can lead to better stability across versions. Lastly, uh, we'd like to be able to extend the type system with new features, but the team is sort of getting bogged down by the fact that every extension is going to require making changes to the type checking algorithm, which then runs into standardization, reliability, and stability issues. Uh, and it's slowing the process down. And in general, it's just easier to add things onto a strong foundation. So 
That's why I think type checking should be complete, meaning every valid program according to, uh, to the type system is going to be accepted by the type checker. Uh, but when I say this, I always get this pushback that this is impractical. We can't make this happen. You're either going to have to bog down people with type annotations or restrict the language so that it's not expressive enough to handle a lot of patterns that people want to support conveniently. And this is where the research I've been doing for about the last 10 years uh, comes into play. What I've been looking at is saying, okay, well, there's a theory of language design and the various features that we understand. But there's also the practice of language design, right? You all have been using languages for a long time. Um, and maybe there's a way to bridge some of the gaps between uh, the theory and the practice. So in particular, there's often this notion for these languages' undecidability that they're decidable in practice. Now, people run into issues with type inference all the time. But with Java, you know, subtyping is undecidable, but people don't actually run into that issue. And I want to understand why that was. And I've been programmed in Java for a long time, um, and I noticed that certain interfaces like Comparable were used in very different ways than other interfaces like toInt function. This is despite the fact that these are basically the same interface, right? They both have a single method that takes a T and returns an int. They're just different names. But you all know that those names imply very different uses patterns for these, for these interfaces. In particular, comparable tends to be used recursively in things like constraints and inheritance clauses, whereas toInt functions are generally used to describe data and will often be found as type arguments to, say, data structures and other generics. So if we label, so I decided to label these two patterns. I'm going to call one of them shapes because they describe the shapes of types. The other one, materials, because they describe the uh, values you actually hand around in your programs. And I said, OK, I'm going to conjecture that every interfacing class that people write falls into one and only one of these two patterns. And if I make that separation, what I showed is that suddenly subtyping becomes decidable. All the, if a hierarchy just happens to conform to this kind of separation, then the existing algorithm that people have to standardize always terminates and always gives the correct answer. So sort of as an accident, you get correctness um, and completeness for the subset of the language that people use in practice. Now, that's if people conform to that. So my students and I analyzed 13 and a half million lines of Java code, generic Java code, and found that indeed every interface and class was classifiable into one of these two categories and only one of these two categories which suggests that the reason why things are undecidable in theory and decidable in practice is that there's this pattern that isn't actually under, explicit in the language of what everyone is accidentally doing, even though they could do theoretically everything, um, that maybe should be incorporated into the language design itself. Right? If they're being used so differently, is there some way we could take advantage of that? So questions like that have got me starting to collaborate uh, with Kotlin. And we've been looking at, say, this pattern and seeing what kinds of applications this pattern would, could have. And one thing we found is that these patterns actually like, captured the uh, intent of how people expected types, their types to be used more accurately than uh, not understanding the pattern. So see why. Let's take a simple expression or pro program and ask yourself, OK, I'm going to hover over this x to find out what type it is. What would you say the answer is? What would you expect your ID or want your ID to say the answer? And this is obviously the kind of question that IntelliJ has to answer all the time. Um, so what it does is it says, OK, well, I have an int and a string. What do those types have in common? Well, if I look at their hierarchies, I can say they both implement comparable. They both implement comparable of different things, but they both implement comparable. So the type of this is comparable star. But if I ask actual programmers what they want, this is not what they want. Nobody expects comparable star here. And that material shape separation that I mentioned earlier explains why. Comparable basically is not actually meant to be a type in of itself. It's not meant to describe values. It's just meant to describe types. It's a type constraint. And so if we were to say, OK, let's integrate that concept into the language design, say, by labeling this as a shape interface, then now the type checker says, oh, well, I can't infer comparable here because that's not actually a type. It's just a type constraint. So get rid of that answer. 
Nobody liked it anyways. What answer does that leave? Any. Um, and turns out that's generally what people want. Uh, so understanding these patterns not only improves the decidability of the language, but also improves the usability of the language. And this is one of many patterns the team and I have been exploring, and one of the many implications on how that, these patterns can affect the algorithms in the language. Now, we've indeed actually found that we can develop a whole new class of type checking algorithm that's sound and complete for both inference and checking, and is efficient, as I'll illustrate in a sec. Um, this algorithm turns out to be really easy to extend compared to traditional, the tr traditional approach. It's simple to standardize because it's complete, and Importantly, it always works. If you give it a program that's valid, it will say yes. You can just reliably know it's going to do the right thing. So to, I'm not going to give this algorithm in this talk. That's a little detailed <laughs> for this kind of session. Um, but I will try to give you a very high-level intuition of how it works and why it works. In particular, we're going to see how we can fix a problem with overprecise initialization. Normally, this problem comes up uh, with builder inference. But for now, I'm just going to use it with for loops. Uh, and this is you know, the last or null function I think we all know pretty well. And this is how I would implement it uh, just off the top of my head. Um, but unfortunately, this gets rejected by the compiler. And what goes wrong is this compiler uses uh, a traditional kind of algorithm that uses what's explicit type construction. So it's saying, OK, there's a bunch of missing types in here. I'm going to fill in those types and then check that those types are consistent with all the other th ways that they're used. And in this case, it fills in the type of result to be nothing question mark, because that's the type of null that's, in, that's it's initialized with. But that's too precise. That's, uh, the programmer didn't mean for that type, right? because there's a later element, assignment to elements, which is why we get this incorrect rejection. So the new algorithm works a little differently. It doesn't actually try to construct any of these types. Instead, it is what I'm currently calling conservativity checking. Um, and that it says, OK, well, these types are just sort of holes in the program. Let's just suppose I fill in those holes. I'm not going to worry about how. I'm just going to suppose they get filled in. What kind of flows between my types would happen in my program? So in this program, right, one flow is we have null flows into result, and then result flows into t question mark. Is that flow OK? Well, yeah, null is a t question mark, so that's just fine. right? That's the point of nullable. Um, Similarly, we have element flows into results, and then result flows again into t question mark. Does that flow OK? Well, element is type t, and t is a subtype of t question mark, so that flow is also good. So without knowing what type of result is, we can still know this program is safe. Um, and while I've given a really simplified example, those kinds of patterns I mentioned earlier with material shape separation we've shown can actually help us generalize to much more complicated programs, arbitrarily complicated programs. And in fact, uh, this algorithm is, can be done in polynomial time, whereas the old algorithm is exponential time. The issue is that these intermediate types, that these holes that we're not bothering to fill in anymore, sometimes those holes are the type that goes in there is exponentially larger than the program itself. So any algorithm that tries to actually fill in the hole is uh, guaranteed to be slower than this kind of algorithm. So that's cool. Normally, when you try to make something smarter, it gets slower. But we actually managed to make it faster and smarter at the same time. But we don't want to just do type checking in this stuff, in this revamping work. But we also want to add new things. And we want to help uh, support better patterns in the Kotlin uh, code bases. So one issue that comes up with this program is what happens if t is a string question mark? Well, the function runs just fine in this case. But someone using this function might run into a problem. Namely, they can't tell the difference between a null that was in the list and the null that indicates nothing was found. And either this limits what they can do, or it might could lead to a bug uh, due to uh, 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 conflating these concepts. So is there a way we can solve this problem? And that brings me to uh, one extension that we're sort of ready to uh, sneak peek, which is union types for errors. So what is a union type? Um, the union of A and B is a type that both A and B are allowed to flow into, and a type that flows into everything else that A and B are allowed to flow into. 
Um, so it's sort of the smallest way to combine A and B. And you might actually not realize it, but you've been using a union type all this time, because T question mark is the same thing as T union null. Right? A T can flow into T union null. Uh, null can flow into T question mark. And then things like T question question mark can also flow into T question mark. And that last one is actually really useful because things like question mark dot implicitly are always relying on the fact that double question marks are the same as single question marks. And what many people have pointed out to the team is that things like unions here are useful, though, not just for null, but for many other things. And there's, but there's a good reason why the team has not added union types, which is that they're known to be incompatible with efficient type checking. So to give you a quick intuition as to why, try to infer the type, of, or the type x in the following problem. Mutable list X is going to be a, must be a subtype of mutable list string union mutable list int. This is the kind of constraint that arises during type checking inference all the time. And a type checking inference algorithm has to figure out what X is once it sees this kind of flow. And if you think about it for a sec, uh, you'll find that, well, there are actually two ways to answer this, and only two ways to answer this. Either X must be string, or X must be init. And that or forces type checking to go through an, through an exponential search. There's no way around it. And if you don't believe me, you can follow, find me afterwards. And I can actually give you a proof that this feature alone makes type checking NP hard, which means we can't solve it efficiently. So that's the reason why we're not planning on adding arbitrary union types to Kotlin. But that doesn't mean union types don't have any value, right? This is about the theory of union types. But what about the practice? Why is it that people are asking for union types? Well, we looked through a bunch of the use cases and found that many of them can be solved by using a restricted notion that I'm mincing and declaring now uh, called categorized unions. And the idea here is that um, you can take the types in your language and categorize them. So you could say, hey, well, this type belongs to the null category. Right, right now, there's only one type that belongs to that category. And these other types are going to belong to the any category. And right now, pretty much everything else belongs to the any category. And once we've done this categorization, we're going to say, OK, we're going to allow unions, but only when the two categories being unioned together belong to different categories. And if you make that restriction, then if you want to figure out whether a type is a subtype of a union type, you can look at that type T and say, OK, well, what category do you belong to? It's, and we have a way of computing the summary very quickly um, and reliably. And say, OK, well, which of A and B belongs to that same category? Because that's the only one I need to check. The other one definitely can't hold. So these categories then have the effect of guiding that search and eliminating the branch so that we have only one case to consider. And as a consequence, with this restriction, we can get type checking and inference done still in polynomial time, using basically the same algorithm we had before. And we've already found that there's some uh, corner cases with dealing with nullable types and in inference uh, that this new algorithm addresses. Uh, but we don't want to just improve the existing algorithm. We want to add new features. And so as I mentioned before, one thing we can do so we can add a new category for error values. These will be things that are like null, but sort of more customized, user custom errors. And with this new category, we can union it together with a bunch of other types that we already have and are used to. So for example, we'll take our last or null program and say, OK, well, the problem that we ran into before was that we're reusing null that everyone else is already using. So I'm going to introduce my own custom error object that I'll call no such value. And I'm going to rewrite this program to use no such value instead of null. That's the, that's the only change I have to make to the body of the, of the program. And then now, because no such null or no such value is an error and belongs to its own category, I can union it with T. Say the return type is T union no such value. And this gives me a program that I can type check reliably, just like I do with nullable types, but also works when T is a string question mark, unlike before. The user, uh, the caller, can distinguish between null and the list and no such value the error. 
So we get this sort of new form of errors um, that are analogous to nulls, but nulls uh, to be usable are uh, really heavily rely on the fact that we have convenient ways to propagate them. And so we need convenient ways to propagate errors. So we can add something like bang dot, which says, okay, if the value is an error, then uh, just propagate that value. Otherwise, call the function or call the method. Just like question mark dot. Similarly, we can have bang colon, which replaces an error with an alternative value, just like question mark colon does. And we can extend bang bang so that whenever the value is an error, it just gets thrown as an exception, just like nulls get turned into a null pointer exception. And if you do this, we've noticed that there's a bunch of you know, last or null and last combinations throughout the standard library and other, and other libraries. And now we can sort of consolidate them as last or error, and then we just have to use bang colon null for last or null, or bang bang to get last. So we can simplify our libraries using uh, errors. Now the name error probably brings something to mind, namely exceptions. And we want to distinguish between errors and exceptions. Um, in particular, we want you to think of errors as values, whereas the exceptions are control flow. Uh, so, but we still want these concepts to interoperate well with each other. So as a consequence, error classes will always have a throw method, which I sort of hinted at as the last slide, that tells you basically how to turn that error of value into exceptional control flow. And similarly, or on the other side, we can take throwable and say, okay, well, throwable has a whole bunch of subclasses. We're gonna make each of those subclasses belong to their own category. And as a consequence, those subclasses can all be union together. And one side effect of that is that we get support for multi-catch, because now I can just write the union type of the two throwable types uh, as my exception type. Um, so, even though that wasn't the original intent, we get a free side effect of additional expression. This is always a good sign for a feature, right? You want a feature, you generally design a feature for a particular purpose, but if people can find other purposes for it that really integrate well with the rest of the language design, that's, a, that's an awesome indicator that design fits well with your language. Now, as sort of a special uh, feature that we're considering, we also are looking into adding a form of try-catch where you don't actually write a type for the exception. It's going to catch all the exceptions, and the type will be inferred to be the union of all the types that are thrown in the body. Now, I'm not planning, or we're not planning on adding typed exceptions to Kotlin, so this is still going to just say throwable whenever there's a Kotlin function in there. But as in terms of interop with existing languages that have typed exceptions, namely Java, then we can say, okay, well, that's going to be a union of the runtime, of runtime exception along with all the explicit exceptions in that Java code. So that then you can use when, and when will exhaustively make sure that you've checked all those cases and convert them to whatever kind of control flow or error value you want to convert them to. And so this design gives a way for developers to trade off between explicit typed error values an implicit untyped exceptional control flow. And in a way that is backwards compatible with um, Colin as it is now and Java interop as it is now. So that is one of the features we're looking to add. Um, if you want to know more if, about more that we're considering, feel free to come find me afterwards or during the q and I guess. Um, but at the moment, uh, I'm going to give a big disclaimer, which is all of this is work in progress. Um, and I'm now realizing that I spoke, probably spoke way too quickly because I have lots of times for questions and answers. But the word alpha has never occurred in any of our discussions. This is very early design work. Um, and part of why we're keeping it here is because we want to get feedback from you all. But we're well aware that there's a lot of work that we need to do. Uh, we need to consider how these features and new algorithms are going to interact with the many features already in Kotlin. In particular, we already know that name resolution and method overloading pose challenges, but we already developed strategies for overcoming those challenges. Uh, we need to implement prototypes of the new algorithm and of these features, and we need to run experiments on them to make sure that the theoretical gains are actual practical, practical gains as well. And 
We need to run trials on, the, on these features on programs in the wild, on example use cases, to check that they really conform, that the patterns that we're relying on really do uh, work in practice, and the kind of use cases we rely, we're expecting to provide really do serve practical needs. And lastly, this is just one feature that I've sort of sneak peeked. There's a bunch of features we want to add, and we want all these features to sort of be coherent, co cohesive design that complement each other rather than conflict with each other. Um, so for these many reasons, don't expect any of this to come out, say, in the next year or anything. But for also all these many reasons, I would really love it if you would reach out to me and tell me your thoughts, tell me features that you would like to see, tell me problems that you see with what I've written up so far, ask questions, anticipate problems, that's what I'd love to hear from people. And if you particularly are interested in the errors uh, or union, union types for errors, then that issue KT68296 uh, has been posted so that people can share their thoughts and just let us know what you think about either what won't work, what will work, how ask questions about how to interrupt with other things, anything that comes to mind. Um, and at that point, as I I've, I've spoke too quickly, I have lots of times for questions and answers, and I'd love to hear what people have to say. Thank you. Uh, yeah, with this new design where the types are categorized into two different categories, mm -hmm. uh, is there any implication of uh, the type belonging to this special error category? Uh, is there any like restrictions on these types? Oh, sure. So the doesn't it doesn't really restrict the type. The when we want to have more fine-grained subcategories. So, for example, for a throwable, I mentioned that all the subclasses would become their own category. There's, there's a caveat there, which is once a class becomes, once you have a generic throwable class, then its subcategories can no longer be their own category. So, the, the, in order to make the algorithm work well, you sort of have to draw a line um, to make sure that the generic problem doesn't leak into the category problem. But can I still put those error objects or uh, into lists or like declare oh, yes, a comparable yes, with this type of error object? Yeah, so errors are still going to be values. It's still a type that you can manipulate the same way. So pretty much anywhere, anywhere null can go currently, errors can go as well. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, something that was not clear for me is um, when you use the throw word, do you stay in the typed error world, or does it become uh, an unchecked exception? Or if you want to stay in the typed error world, do you always need to use explanation mark bang? Or is it not yet been designed? Um, so are you saying, so if I use bang bang, then it'll be turned into an untyped exception. Does that answer your question? Is you also show the dot throw? Does that also turn it into an unchecked exception? Yes, because Kotlin functions are not going to have typed exceptions on them. So dot throw, bang bang is essentially short, if you know it's an error, it's going to be shorthand for dot throw. So if you want to stay inside of the typed error world, you're going to always need to use explanation uh, mark bang. Uh, or bang dot. Yes. Of, yes, OK, thank you. Um, I have a question over here. Um, <laughs> on the. Interoperability with exception slide, you showed uh, that you have the throw where you can go from an error to an exception. Uh, are there any plans to do it the other way around to have a, a shorthand syntax for try? I don't know, try question mark or on, er on exception just error? Uh, I don't think we have any plans for that. That's probably one of those things that will come down to writing up programs and saying, oh, this is a really common pattern. We should really handle this pattern. Um, the thing that comes to mind at first, though, is that uh, since Kotlin exceptions are going to be generally, typically exceptions should be thought of as untyped, except for when you're doing Java interop. So once it's turned into exception land, it's not going to have any type information to tell you really how to turn it into an error. Um, so you'll have to do a more manual process for that. So that leads me to suspect that there wouldn't be a great shorthand for this, but we haven't gone that far. 
Thank you. Hey, over here. Um, thanks for the presentation. So um, I was wondering if you are thinking on adding support for um, building and composing errors um, automatically with some kind of operators that would be useful, for example, for validation checks when you want to validate several um, properties and then bundle all uh, these in one error? Um. Oh, I see. So, uh, I mean, I'm, let me see if this answers your question. So error, right, prototyping is actually how people are going to specify errors. Um, and the slide, we, I threw, threw up one potential design, which is just sort of mark, put a marker, error class, error object. Um, but in that design, you can have error subclasses. Um, you can have sealed error classes. None of that causes any, uh, you, you can think of it as its own special hierarchy, uh, but it's still a hierarchy just like the existing uh, Kotlin hierarchy. So it's a hierarchy that has different use cases in mind, and the syntax and the operators are going to be optimized towards that, those use cases, but will still uh, work much like the hierarchies you're familiar with. Okay, I got it. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, here. <laughs> Do you have any constraints on what interfaces can be shape interfaces? Or any interface can be? Oh, um, so the, when you make something a shape, inter shape interface, uh, so we haven't, we haven't fleshed out that too much, but at the, from the, the theory that we established long ago, um, there is no need to constrain what the content of that interface is. It can, be, have, it can have arbitrary generic parameters, they can be bounded, they could, you can do all that the same way as you would before. It just limits how you're allowed to use that interface. So if you make something a shape interface, then it can't be used um, as, say, a type argument, as the type of a field, things like that. So you should really only be expecting to see it in inheritance clauses and type constraints. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, this reminds me very much to the arrow either type or result. Is this something that came to mind because of those kind of uh, you know types that we have in the functional library arrow, or how this came to to the roadmap? You could tell. Um, so I don't know the entire history of it because I got pulled in being like, hey, this is something we'd like to add. Can you help us do this? Uh, my understanding is that there was an observation that people were moving towards um, sort of more like the result pattern you see in, in Rust, I think was the one, but maybe it's also in the arrow library. Um, and uh, this seemed like a more Kotlin-style way to handle that pattern. Okay, thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, right here. The, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> stand up, yeah. Um, the try catch without um, the exception type. I worry that could make code like a little less readable. I wonder if the idea is like people would generally return union error types in their functions. If that should be like a you know kind of standard practice. If you, if you've thought about that at all. So my like so this is very much like a, here's a guess of something we might do. So there's a reasonable chance we just say this is not something we want. Um, for me, like one thing, so I'm, uh, I'm gonna go like, uh, say my own comments. Um, so with the sort of Kotlin becoming, sort of having more and more languages that it's intended to interrupt, I would like to see a way where you can write, or make, make it easier for people to say, okay, here's my Kotlin boundary. And then I'm going to write a little bit of code beyond the boundary that's language specific to say maybe Java, but then I'll have a different one for JavaScript or something like that. And so this would provide, I would see this try catch being used something in that sort of, okay, I have now these error values that I'm, my Kotlin code expects me to use, but I'm interrupting with Java functions that use exceptions. And so this is a nice way to get me a checked way to make sure I've converted all those exceptions into errors. Does that make sense? All right, so I'll stand up. I oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm uh, blinded up here. <laughs> a lot of us build backend systems, and in that capacity, we interact a lot with libraries from the Java 
ecosystem, obviously. In that ecosystem, the, the word error is very, it has a very significant meaning, right? Mm -hmm. I'm sure you guys have discussed that during the <laughs> conceptualization here. So, but could so, it be an obvious, you know, mix-up potential? What's your reasoning on this? Sure. So we uh, let's just say like we had to come up with a name for the talk, <laughs> and we discussed a bunch of names, and we're like, "Error is the one that's going to be the most intuitive to how people expect it to be used." So we'll go with that one. But we're still debating about other names. Um, one that like uh, it's come up as like Sentry. Others are Sentinels. So we're going to play this out, and if you have thoughts either on reasons why this would be really problematic, because that's what you mentioned, we definitely have thought about as possibly being, as being a problem, but you know, it's hard to anticipate the scale that that problem might cause. Um, uh, or if you have other names that you think, hey, this would be a great name, I'd love this idea, but like to try naming it this way and to avoid these kinds of confusions, those are exactly the kind of things I'd love to see on that issue. Yeah. Yeah, I can stand up. Thanks Thank for a great talk. Uh, really interesting. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the error types are similar to the normal types, like the sealed interfaces and so mm -hmm. on. Does that also mean that we can add data into the errors? Like, let's say I have a value class for a name, and I have certain rules for what is a valid name. Can I also add, like, hey, this is the part of the name that is invalid into my error? Yep. So errors can have fields, just like you'd expect for classes. Um, I should clarify that unlike with exceptions, errors won't come with stack traces. Uh, so that's both, so that you are responsible, if you care about provenance, you're responsible doing that provenance yourself. But it means that uh, you don't have this huge uh, slowdown just for building a stack trace every time you build an error. Thank you. Hey, uh, th oh. thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering uh, for the catch-all, mm -hmm. if it would catch uh, any kind of trouble, including, say, cancellation exception. I have not thought about that yet. <laughs> I'll admit that we haven't gone that far. <laughs> but if, again, that's a great question for the issue. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was uh, going to ask, uh, what is the problem with the, uh, how other languages have solved this issue with type uh, inference uh, with the generic uh, union types such as TypeScript? Uh, so, having uh, run this by some TypeScript developers, uh, TypeScript developers, from my understanding, are sort of used to, I'm going to try this out and the TypeScript doesn't work, I'll just write it differently. Um, and it, <laughs> and that, that's like, I, I, like, so I am not like a person, dogmatic person. As I view languages having lots of different approaches, and that's a perfectly valid approach um, in my mind. It's just not the one that the Colin team would like to go for. Uh, things like reliability and predictability are stuff that they uh, advocate for. Um, TypeScript people have been doing an amazing job of making their algorithms smarter and able to handle a lot more things. But it's certainly not the case that they're decidable or anything like that. And people, I do, I do know that people run into these kinds of limitations. So it's a space of trade-offs, and they've made the trade-offs of we want to have a lot more precision, um, also because we're retrofitting a type system onto an existing system, whereas Kotlin would say, okay, we want enough precision to capture the patterns that people really care about, uh, but keep it down so that we can handle it all reliably. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And um, another question about interop. Uh, so let's say with Java, uh, if we want to call this function, uh, last or error that we have, that has a re uh, return type of um, union, uh, what would that look like from the Java side? Sure. So uh, the plan for like Java JVM kind of side is to uh, basically give them uh, like an under approximation of the type. So, okay, if we have this union of things, what do they have in common? And unfortunately, there's going to be a loss of information there, uh, but we really want, Kotlin's gotten so big now in terms of most of the code you know, is Kotlin code and the interop is getting smaller and smaller. We really want to start optimizing for the Kotlin on its own, its self experience without sacrifice, or, uh, and we're now willing to sort of sacrifice a little bit of the interop experience um, in terms of that kind of precision so that Colin programmers can excel in making their own programs. 
but you mentioned that uh, error types uh, will have like their own separate category uh, from normal oh, types. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that will still be a, its own, uh, they'll still be part of the uh, class hierarchy. So in Kotlin, there, or sorry, in, in Java, there would be a class for each of those errors, and that and you can do stuff with those classes. But whenever you do a union type, it'll basically get approximated to object, and that's just sort of a loss that we have to admit in order to give this kind of functionality to Kotlin developers. Thank you. Hi. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Um, you here, here. Uh, <laughs> you distinguish between shape and material interfaces to achieve mm -hmm. polynomial time type checking. Um, does that mean we also have to achieve, um, annotate all our interfaces as such uh, to achieve this polynomial time type checking? And what happens if we don't? Uh, good question. So. Um, there are a couple ways to do it. One, and we haven't decided what we're going to do. Uh, one is, uh, we, so one option is just say, okay, so long as people conform to this, they're going to get that guarantee. And then it's your fault if you don't conform to this. Um, and that gives you lots of flexibility, but it makes things, uh, you know, it makes the guarantees for a compiler less, uh, weaker. Um, Another option uh, is that the compiler can sort of do analyses on these usage patterns and make sure that things are being used in these kinds of different ways. Uh, there's limitations to that because that's sort of a, okay, well, just because this code is using it that way does not guarantee that other people are going to use it that way. Uh, but it does mean that everything is, uh, can be retrofitted easily onto the system. Uh, and then another comp option is to add uh, like a keyword like shape or add it and a type in or like you know an annotation for this, uh, and then the compiler would do all that checking and have the nice stronger co composability guarantees. So we're still figuring out what of those solutions would work best for the community, not just um, both in terms of okay if you're going to write that code, what's easiest to write, but also in terms of okay we have to migrate existing code to this, and that's an important consideration of this process. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, how are you? Um, so union types for error checking are amazing. Like uh, to be able to force exhaustiveness checking, for example, in callers. Um, and I think something that Rust has already proved is that you can stretch this to anywhere where you have like a, a state machine, for example, and you want to force your caller to handle all of the possible flows. Would with this approach, would uh, users be able to define their own type categories and kind of opt in? To the, you don't want to, to allow like arbitrary, you know, string or int, but could I say, okay, for my type, I do want these two to be the same categories, and I want to be able to return a union of, uh, you know, state A and state B. So that is a question that we are exploring, and this is sort of one of the, the situations of, okay, we can give this functionality. Um, is that going to cause things to get too complicated for everybody, or is that going to really enable cool use cases like what you're describing? Um, so we have not figured out the answer to that. Similarly, like errors, we know is a concrete one, but maybe that could just be uh, like, uh, as you said, sort of okay. Well, if you make people their own click. Uh, enable people to have their own categories, and that could just be part of the standard library. Here's a new error category, and just extend that if you want. Um, so we're figuring that out, and uh, the examples you give, I think I would love for you to post on that issue, um, so we can look at those as uh, things to consider for that. Thank you. Uh, hi. Uh, my question... Uh... <laughs> Here? Ah, there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my question uh, would be about the part uh, where you showed this flow uh, analysis um, to identify the, to basically check whether the last or not uh, example uh, is correct. Uh, in that example, it was not clear for me, uh, does this new algorithm um, identify any type in the end uh, for the result variable, because if it does not, then that would cause a lot of uh, problems in IDs, context helps, and so Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm laughing at myself because I, you know, I mentioned that I like, clearly ended too early, which meant I forgot to say a lot of important things. And that was one of the important things I forgot to say. Uh, this happens when I get nervous. Uh, so yes, the algorithm can construct types if you wanted to. It just doesn't do it by default, which we found it gives a stronger guarantee. But if you, if you were to hover over, it'll be able to say, okay, here's the type of information that you need. Um, and it can give that for you. I have, I have a question here. No, yeah. Hi. Um, can we distinguish between multiple uh, error types? Can we just join them? Are there 
every error type is in own category, or we ah. uh, have to do subtypes? So this uh, this goes into again that sort of we're still in the design space of what works best, um, but it's very plausible that the design will actually be. Uh, that every time you say error, you're making a whole new category. And then you can make subclasses, and maybe those subclasses will be the same category, maybe they'll be fresh categories, maybe there's a marker that you say, hey, this should be belong to a new category. That's very much in the space we're figuring out. And if you have use cases that you think would motivate one way of making that design or another, please fire them on that issue. Thank you. Are we done? Are we out of time? <laughs> That's why I'm not answering questions. All right. Thank you very much.